Hi, welcome to Discussions on Democracy. I'm Elaine Engelhart from Utah Valley University, and today we're going to be discussing the Topaz internment camp that's located by Delta, Utah, and what significance this event had in World War II. And we have three guests with us on campus today to do this discussion on democracy. This is brought to you by the Center for the Study of Ethics, and it's a dream we've had with the Ethics Center for quite a while to be able to do these types of discussions. And so um, first, I'd like to introduce you to Shirsten Lyon. And Shirsten, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're involved in um, discussions about the Topaz internment camp and other events of World War II? Sure. Um, I'm a professor of history at California State University down in San Bernardino. And um, while I was doing my research to become a professor, getting a PhD, um, I started doing some research on citizenship. And that research led me to um, do some oral history interviews with some men who, during World War II, were put into internment camps. And, um, and then they received draft notices while they were still being held, and they refused. Um, they tried, in some cases, to make a test case out of it, and in some cases just um, just decided that it wasn't right to be drafted into the military while they and their family were being uh, detained in Topaz in, in one case and in Colorado in another case. And so I started doing research on that um, and that led me to write a book manuscript uh, about that particular incident and it also led me to meet uh, Jane and Steve and get more involved with what Topaz was doing uh, to preserve that history. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, to my left, we have Jane Beckwith. And Jane, thanks for coming. And tell us a little bit about yourself and your involvement in the Topaz Project. Um, I'm a high school English teacher. And I had, in 1982, I had two fairly large journalism classes. And um, I teach in a small school, so we needed more topics to talk about. And I thought, well, let's start with local history. And we started. Uh, investigating Topaz, and um, it was it was a very dynamic time. Students would go out into the community and find out things that had, had um, occurred there before either of us were born, and uh, come back and report to the class. And so we were all teaching each other. And uh, the the history of Topaz is so complicated and and really compelling that um, I just never really stopped thinking about it. And uh, Steve, would you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and, um, and your experience with sure. the Topaz Project? My mother was from Oakland, California, so she was one of the ones, one of the ones that turned out at Topaz. And so that's where my interests lie. And then uh, about six years ago, Jane and the other board members on the Topaz Museum Board asked me to be, become a board member with them. And so it's really within this last six years that I've really uh, even learned about internment. And so most of my understanding has just been in a short period of time. So. Did you have some visits with your mother about her experiences in internment? Uh, very little. Um, the internees are very much like the World War II veterans. Uh, there was very little family discussion about internment. Every once in a while, my mother would mention something about, yeah, we did that in camp, or, you know, and, and so the term camp was always kicked around the house, but uh, we never went into detail with her about what life was like in, in the internment camp or or any of the strife that they went through. These last six years must be really quite startling for you to find out what she went through. Uh, what very life was much like. so. Yeah. Uh, and the more, the more I get into internment, the more different facets of internment you turn over, and uh, the deeper I dig, and the more interest I have in, in the subject. So. Oh well, thank you. Well, Shirsten, why do you think that the government? decided that they needed to even have this concept of internment. Why was it uh, even uh, a necessity to put the, the, the Japanese Americans or even a Japanese who were visiting in these, these camps? My response, I guess, would be that the government didn't do it. The government was very fragmented about this. So uh, a minority of people within the government um, had uh, long-standing fears and prejudices against uh, Japanese immigrants and against Asian immigrants um, entirely, especially um, Chinese immigrants. 
And those kinds of racial prejudices carried over into the war. And um, so the minority believed, I think, um, that based on race they couldn't tell who was loyal and who was disloyal. And that drove, um, drove the movement. And I think um, the majority probably were against it, um, but didn't have the unification or the strength or whatever it took uh, to stand in the way of that um, during that kind of wartime hysteria. Jane, any additional insights on why the government decided to do this? Well, sometimes I almost think, um, well, there is a confusion between Japanese nationals and Japanese Americans, and uh, as, as that comes closer together um, in someone's mind, then after Pearl Harbor, um, I almost think it was a retaliatory gesture to say, look what you, meaning this confused group, did to Pearl Harbor, this is what we're going to do back. Um, so I think there was a, a sort of a tit-for-tat kind of slap uh, mm -hmm. that happened um, also. And I think that there were certain people, as Sherston said, that had this notion and they drove and drove and drove and pushed and encouraged people to be um, uh, fearful. and. I mean, fear seems to be um, kind of a reoccurring subject um, in democracy, um, even certain things, you know, today. Um, so I think a multitude of combinations of, of um, causes, but part of it, I think, was, um, I'm not sure if it would have happened without Pearl Harbor. But there was certainly a lot of angry retaliation, lots of prejudice. Um, that probably would have continued um, for a long time. Mm -hmm. Now you bring up these terms, um, a Japanese national, and then we would have a Japanese American citizen, and then I understand that be, to be considered even one-eighth Japanese, that this was still someone who needed to be intermed or interred and, and had to be uh, taken out of society. Is this correct, or could any of you explain that to me? Steve, what are your thoughts about these distinctions? Uh, sure. Actually, uh, the criteria for internment was actually one-eighth Japanese. Uh, at that point in time, in the 1940s, there were probably very few people who were even one-eighth. Uh, there may have been a few one-fourths, uh, but, but there were very few interracial marriages back then between Japanese and Caucasians. So, you know, whatever that percentage is, it really doesn't matter. Uh, but what, what they, the terminology was aliens and non-aliens non-alien being the actual citizen, being the Japanese, second generation Japanese that were actually born in, in the United States, and then the aliens being the original Issei, which is first generation Japanese, which immigrated to the country. The idea that people were not allowed to become naturalized citizens, and there were laws and uh, preventative measures, so that even if people from Japan wanted to assimilate into um, an American democracy. They were prevented. They could not. There yeah, was they, a 1922 Immigration Act which uh, prevented Asian Americans from becoming naturalized. And that went all the way up till the 1953 Act, I think, of immigration where, where they once again permitted that. Uh, so even, you know, they, they always refer to two-thirds citizens that were inter interned and then one-third not, not citizens being interned, but that one-third really couldn't become citizens anyway. And so you have that relation to present-day immigration also. And just as a side light, um, Native Americans could not become citizens either. Oh. Um, so that was about, I don't know if it was the same act, but um, 1952, 1954, some time around there. 1924. 1924 was the, the blocking. The Asian. Is, the, is the first time that um, Native Americans became citizens. Or oh, could 1924, just, mm -hmm, okay. That could just uh, automatically become citizens. Um, and it comes back to that deep-seated prejudice. Um, after the Civil War, um, or up until the Civil War, only free white persons could become citizens of the United States. Um, so legally we have this race-based um, yes legal construction of who can be an American.
after the Civil War and slavery was ended, that had to change. And so it, then it changed in 1870 where only white persons and people of African descent could be citizens of the United States. And so all of these court cases that you're talking about tested that. And so Chinese immigrants tested that and the court said, no, you're not white, you can't be a citizen. And Japanese immigrants tested that. And they said, no, you can't, you're not white. Um, alien land laws prevented Japanese from owning property. And so that history of preventing Japanese immigrants uh, from being fully invested in America and being fully American, have, having full rights, started a long time before World War II. And so a lot of people continue or consider uh, what happened during World War II to be a continuation of these kinds of um, very institutionalized prejudices. And so deep-seated prejudice, as, as Shirsten's pointing out, and then um, people are told, the Japanese um, Americans and the Japanese nationals are told, um, you need to be able, you need to evacuate your premises within a certain amount of time and um, show up at these points and we're going to take you to a place that you're going to live. What, what provisions were made for them? Could they um, uh, rent out their homes? Could they, did they have time to um, uh, sell things or put money in the bank? Jane, what, what was, what was, what's the story that you hear about uh, well, most of those? Because there were 120,000 plus, there's about 120,000 stories, you know, um, so everyone's a little bit different. Some people could not own property. Some people had put property in their children's names. Other people were, um, were able to own property and then let their neighbors um, tend their farms or their house or something. Um, other people who were probably living in San Francisco, living in an apartment, had to liquidate um, any furniture that they had. Um, so uh, most of the stories that I've heard is that when people came to this country, they were really starting from scratch. And then when they left to go to, to the camp facilities, they had to start over again. And then when they went back, um, when they got out of the camps, then they started over again. So um, a real uh, possibility to just enmesh themselves in poverty um, um, just over and over again. Oh, it's amazing. I, I like um, the way you put that, Bell, 120,000 stories. Uh, Steve, what are your impressions of, of how most people had to cope with this order? Every family had a different story. Um, you had, like Bainbridge Island, they only had two days uh, notification before they had to evacuate. So what could you actually do within those two days to prepare yourself for that? Uh, same with, I believe, Terminal Island in Los Angeles only had two days. So they had to sell boats, try to sell boats, try to, you know, uh, sell houses. And you have to remember, you know, the alien land laws went back to 1913. And so, uh, the original Issei were not permitted to own land, so most of them were renters. And if they were going to an internment camp, there was going to be no way that they could maintain those rents. And even if they had a mortgage on their property, there was going to be no way that they could maintain that mortgage. And so most of those people did lose those properties. Uh, in the case of my mother's family, uh, they had just purchased a new car and a new piano, and they lost both of those. They had to fire sale those. And because of the fact that you had all these Japanese and, and the Caucasians knowing that the Japanese were being sent away and had to do this, you know, they could pretty much ask to sell that, that liquidate that stuff for just pennies on the dollar. Yeah, people so, sold cars for yeah, $30. Yeah. Uh, new refrigerators for $5. Oh. Um, um, I, I heard a story, a woman had a set of china uh, from um, Japan and someone wanted it and she was so furious that she just took it out in the backyard and broke the pieces uh, because of not only her anger and frustration at, at moving but the insult that um, they were not worth uh, what, what she felt that it was really worth. So. Oh, that, that is heart wrenching. Well, um, so, Shirsten, we have these, these horrendous stories, and um, they're out of their homes, and now they're to go to these camps. 
Are the camps already built? Did they uh, anticipate these folks coming, or did they put them in temporary uh, camps until they got some of these camps built? I understand Topaz was built for about 8,000 inhabitants. Yes, um, when you have that many people um, that uh, the government is evacuating that quickly, um, they needed some time to, f to build the permanent facilities. And so, of course, they um, put people into whatever facilities they could as quickly as possible until um, the more permanent uh, camps were built. And so that's why you had people being moved immediately into um, racetracks and stadiums. And that's where you hear the really horrific stories of people being put into uh, horse stalls that had been hastily um, whitewashed. Um, to try and get them ready for people to live in them. But of course, you know, people walk in and they can tell that they're, you know, in a place where a racehorse had been uh, kept up until that point. Um, but other facilities were also banged up very quickly, um, which meant that the facilities were very much below standard, um, very cold, um, very hot in the summer when people first started being moved into the camps. So it must have been just um, very disappointing when people left San Francisco and uh, ended up in, in Delta. Um, Jane, any reactions on um, uh, what, have you heard stories of what it was like to find themselves uh, going from San Francisco to the desert and winds of Delta? Well, I think the biggest disappointment came from going from San Francisco to San Bruno. Um, oh. that's, that's only 20 miles, maybe, uh, something Not like that. Not even 20 miles. Yeah, 20, 15 miles from San Francisco. So. San Francisco was their home, and they could still see, um, but they were behind a um, chain link fence and, and not able to really be free to go. So they spent uh, from, oh, they were moving in April, March, May, into um, uh, the Tanferan racetrack. And at that point, they had double kind of uh, disappointment because they were so close to San Francisco but not able to go back. And then the Issei, or first generation, felt that their children would be protected because they were citizens. So with those two forces, I think that they were pretty much, um, um, it was probably the low point. Um, so even though they came to Delta, which was very remote, um, I think in some ways there was some sort of relief. Um, the only thing they now had to worry about is how long would they be there, um, you know, what would be the conditions of being there. Um, they pretty much knew their fate, and uh, and so there. Um, Heart Mountain was a little uh, different because um, even though there wasn't um, a barbed wire fence up around Topaz when they first came, they felt like they knew that there was going to be barbed wire with the, the uh, guard tower. Heart Mountain, on the other uh, ha uh, the other hand, in Wyoming, they thought that they were being sent there for their own protection which was one of the kind of lies that was foisted off onto them. And so um, once that fence went up in Heart Mountain, then that was a demoralizing time uh, uh, for them also. Okay, thank you. Steve, any, uh, anything you'd like to add to that, the impressions of being moved out of your home into incredibly substandard and horrific conditions? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, it had to be devastating for them. And I think Jane is right in that the devastation probably took place going from home to the, the temporary camp, whether it was Tanfran or Santa Anita or, you know, one of the other ones. Uh, but they cho the government chose racetracks uh, because their criteria, the government really didn't know what they were doing at, in the beginning. And so the government didn't know exactly where they were going to house these people. So when they didn't have the camp, get the camps ready, what the government actually anticipated was that more of the in, uh, Japanese Americans would have moved inland on their own during, they had a volunteer, uh, quote, unquote, uh, voluntary evacuation period, of, which lasted about three months or so. And not enough people went, and so that's when the government started fretting and started constructing these camps. And then they looked for temporary housing. And so their criteria was they were looking for places with water and electricity. And that's how they settled on the horse race tracks, is because those were the largest areas with water and electricity. 
so they moved him into the race and that had to be the most devastating period. I think going from there to the permanent in camps was not so bad. Uh, what was probably still weighing on their mind is what was going to happen with them. Because you can imagine, you know, we all know the ending to this story and how it all ends and they were all released. But w had the war gone badly, can you imagine what would have happened with those Japanese internees had the war gone badly? The facilities and thing is really important because um, at this time you have large numbers of people putting, um, being put into uh, what we conveniently call internment camps now, but there was really no definition for it. Um, jails even at that point had higher standards and there are all kinds of stories um, that I hear from people who for one reason or another ended up in um, a real Department of Justice internment facility because they renounced their citizenship after this um, traumatic ordeal or um, resisted the draft because of their treatment and they ended up in real federal prisons and they said it was paradise compared to the conditions that we experienced um, in the camps. Um, the camps never would have held up to any standard of any kind of jail or prison and it's because they lacked any kind of legal categorization that they were able to be so bad. Um, and yet people still say, you know, by comparison, of course, they weren't like the concentration camps in Germany. And so they really fall into this abyss where we still have a hard time conceptualizing what they are. And it's that lack of definition that gives them the power um, and really uh, is what made them so problematic. Because n not all, but many men, leaders in the community, were taken the very night of Pearl Harbor. And so that left um, women uh, to try to dispose of businesses. That left people really fearful, even if they only took, I think it was about 2,500, 2,200, something like that, the night of Pearl Harbor, well, and the, put them in, in these. That night of Pearl Harbor, I think, was 736 or something like that. I, I thought it was a little you know, more. But, but by the time the week was over, I think they were yeah, up to. So yeah. they have now taken those men someplace into these justice camps, and the wives have no idea where their husbands are. Um, so now it's sort of like, what will happen to us? If they can just come into our houses and take right. us away, uh, take someone away, and they, they, the government particularly took the, the leaders, or they took someone who had um, fairly strong ties to Japan, which of course um, makes it very clear there was a great deal of surveillance in that community uh, prior to um, the, um, the regular internment. So now women are thinking, um, you know, will I be split up from my children too? Um, I am not an American citizen, but what will happen to um, our family unit? Um, that, that was hor horrific, and so I, I think Tanferan pales in comparison to um, those families that were split like that. And it was um, the gradual nature of the erosion of people's rights that really um, mm -hmm. was so damaging. Um, the people who were taken away immediately um, were on FBI lists. And the government, you know, even if you suspect um, that their evidence wasn't very strong, they had evidence that um, could be used against them, and they were put through a, a real process of due process, um, put into Department of Justice facilities um, for um, documented reasons. Um, it was uh, the later removal of everybody without any kind of due process. They didn't have any charges brought against them. There was no individual um, suspicion and to have those 120,000 people put into camps um, that defied any kind of legal categorization. They couldn't de contest their own um, detention or you know, incarceration. Um, that's what was um, so problematic legally. Steve, what is, what's the loyalty oath? I know that we have some of these horrible problems that Shearston's talking about. What was the loyalty oath, and where did that come into the whole picture? Uh, well, it's not an oath. It was a questionnaire, mm -hmm. and it's commonly known as the loyalty questionnaire. It was actually entitled, uh, I think, an application for leave clearance. And this was a form that they required, I think, all internees over the age of 18 to uh, fill out. And it asked a bunch of questions, but the specific questions, uh, I think, was 27 and 28, mm -hmm. uh, which actually asked if he, uh, 
would you be willing to uh, serve in the armed forces? And it was a question that was posed to both men and women, uh, if they would serve in the armed forces. And the second question, 28, I believe was, would you be willing to forswear any allegiance to any other entity other than the United States? And you can just imagine that, uh, that you know, this gave some problem to some of the uh, Japanese Issei because we've, we talked about them not being American citizens. So if you forswear allegiance to Japan, you are suddenly without a country. So that's what the loyalty questionnaire actually became. Because if you were a citizen and you were asked, would you forsake your allegiance to the Emperor of Japan, and you said yes, the implication was that you in the past had had um, uh, an, allegiance an allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. So the questions were just so badly poised. And on the basis of those two questions, then people were designated either yes, yes, or else yes, no. And then they were counseled until they changed either to yes, yes, or, or no, no. And if they said no, no, then they were taken from Topaz or the other camps and that, um, excuse me, spirited off to Tule Lake um, and declared disloyal to the United States. So Tule Lake, okay, Shearston, what's Tule Lake? Um, that became the detention facility for all the people who used the loyalty questionnaire to protest. Um, most people who answered no, no, or refused to answer, um, if they had been given the exact same questionnaire in 1940, would have answered it yes, yes, without a problem. Although it was poorly written, so they may have still had questions. Um, but the problem was, is, was when and where they were given the questionnaire. And um, what happened was, um, this really exposes the diversity within the government. Even the director of the War Relocation Authority, when it first started, Milton Eisenhower, thought that this was probably illegal. And he wrote letters to his lawyers and said, can you find any justification that makes this legal? Can we call it a draft? Can we say people have been drafted into some kind of civil service? What can we do to make this legal? And he was very troubled, even as director of this organization that was meant to um, handle this process of evacuating 120,000 people. And they wrote back and they said, I'm sorry, you know, a draft, you can't draft women and children, and you can't do it based on race. And, and so he was shut down at every turn. He eventually resigned his post and moved over to a, another agency and continued to agitate and say, this isn't fair. Some Japanese Americans are still serving in the military and they're loyal. How can we hold so many Japanese Americans without any right of due process, without the right to die for their country in service of the country, while some are still serving. He said, we need to do something to get them out. That process started this move to, to create some way where individuals could establish their loyalty. So when it came down to filling out the questionnaire and having just a very bureaucratic process of determining who is loyal and who is not loyal, then people in the camp said, if it was so easy to determine who was loyal and who was not loyal, why didn't you do this months ago? Yeah. And so it created a lot of problems for the government and actually exposed a lot of the flaws, uh, the flawed logic and the flawed legal basis for the camps, um, the Quorum Nobis cases that actually ruled that the um, detention of people, that some of the cases that test and determine um, were unconstitutional. Um, went back to this flip-flopping the government did between saying you can't tell the difference, they all need to be put in camps, but maybe if we have them fill out a questionnaire we can determine who's loyal enough to be released and who needs to be put in further detention. So it creates all kinds of problems. There were families, uh, members, two might say yes, yes, and four might say no, no, and I mean I had a lot of, not a lot, but I've had uh, people tell me my father never spoke to me again after I said yes, yes. Um, and I mean, you know, that was in, let's say, 1990. Um, and so they died estranged over the basis of these, these two questions. The Issei in Topaz organized and voted block by block to send petitions to the United States government and said, this is unfair. You have to change these questionnaires. And in response to the protest at Topaz, and also some of the protests at other camps like Manzanar, the government did change the questions for the Issei mm -hmm. and didn't ask them to forswear allegiance to Japan, just said, will you um, promise that you will do nothing to interfere with U.S. war effort? 
And so they won that case. Um, but then the citizens <laughs> had to figure out what they were going to do. Uh -huh. And in Topaz, then they, blo they voted block by block again and said, what are we going to do? And a very um, strong, um, very angry population of young people said, we should just refuse to, to answer the question at all. Um, particularly because it was tied to this effort to raise a, a, a segregated combat unit. Mm -hmm. um, it was all set to create some kind of basis to determine who was loyal enough uh, to serve in the military and to create a segregated combat unit of, of Nisei soldiers. Oh, and so they said, we won't serve in the military until mm -hmm. you um, give us our freedoms back. Release us from these camps. Well, Don't make us... Release our parents. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so, so they voted not to uh, answer the loyalty questionnaire. They voted to just shut down the entire process. And so um, the uh, military got word of it and put Fort Douglas on orders that they might have to intervene and raised all the alarms. And, uh, um, and the War Relocation Authority sent in some of their top psychologists. Um, the leaders at Topaz met behind closed doors. They came back out to meet with the internee population and they said, you are citizens of the United States. You have just been asked by your government to fill out a questionnaire that is a part of the sele selective service process. If you don't, you will be charged with espionage. And that completely broke the entire um, resistance movement. And so individuals went on to refuse, to answer no, no, or to answer yes, but feeling very bitter inside. It splintered the community from being very organized, very democratic, uh, kind of unit that really tried to protest their unconstitutional treatment. Mm -hmm. Once the camps were open and people were free, that, um, that kind of reaction didn't really stop because um, I, I have a lot of people who come to Topaz, um, you know, they come back to visit. And so other people say, and I've witnessed this, they'll say, well, what camp were you in? And someone will say, um, first I went to Tule Lake. So it's always, first I went to Tule Lake. Um, because if they say, I was in Tule Lake afterwards, that's, that's a real mark that says, I said no, no. And for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, they've had that stigma that says, I was declared, um, or I declared myself to be disloyal, or the government um, uh, interpreted my answers to be disloyal. So that just didn't stop. Uh, the minute the war was over and everything was fine and, and um, back to normal. Jane, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what's going on in Delta at this time because here we have all these events that Shearston has just described and then you've got this community that's smaller than, than the internment camp and they're not used to this, this kind of activity going on. How, how are the folks in Delta responding to having an internment camp there? Uh, well, you put that in present tense as if kind of now and I'm going to kind of throw it back to the tense during uh, the 40s. However, I wasn't born then, so you know I might be suspect on uh, my scholarship here. But um, I think that there were plenty of um, very varied reactions. Um, uh, there were people in town who were pretty isolation, isolated. Um, uh, there were a fair number of people who felt like Japanese were not to be trusted. There were people, I'm sure, that felt like they got what they deserved because of Pearl Harbor. I mean, there were all kinds of reactions. But as the war went on and as uh, people in Topaz stayed, it seemed to me that the more Delta people interacted with Topaz people, then they got to know them as human beings instead of someone that was frightening or someone that the government had said were potential saboteurs. So, some people invited um, the attorneys to come and work, and because of gas shortages, um, Topaz is 16 miles from Delta, so they would actually live in the house um, in, and live there with the family that had invited them to work. And so that made quite a difference. Um, mm -hmm. So just as there are 120,000 stories from the Japanese American point of view, I think that there were many stories that are pretty difficult to categorize in, um, in Delta. But Delta was small, 1,500 people. Um, the camp had 11,000 people go through, um, maybe peak population, 8,100, 
um, 8,300, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it would have been pretty exciting to be alive then and find out exactly <laughs> what happened, but I don't know. Uh, yes, I, th I think so too, because um, I come from that community as well, and uh, um, th the stories are, 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 were, were rather scarce. We, we had known about well, it, but we didn't, we didn't hear very much talk about it, uh, so I don't know if the community felt shame about it or, or, or uh, what I their reaction was. Japanese American community has always uh, maintained that they were silent. They talked about camp. Uh, yeah, that happened at camp. But um, our community, Delta, was pretty silent about it too. And um, I think there were uh, a myriad of reasons why. I think there was uh, this sense of, oh, what have we done? Um, let's just not talk about it. Or um, Delta is a pretty harsh place to make a living. And so instead of going back and maybe trying to right a wrong or trying to um, live in that um, kind of working things out. You're just trying to put food on the table and milk the cow and, and uh, make sure the pigs don't get out, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So things just start going forward. So, I mean, I think a lot of people felt that there was probably some kind of injustice happening. But what do you do about it? Um, yeah, I think that there wasn't a lot of empowerment. Um, I mean, I grew up in the Vietnam generation, uh, the time that um, I sort of learned how to shut down something, you know. Um, um, I think that that we were not, as a country, uh, prone to say, oh, government, you may have made a mistake. Here's what I'm going to do. So um, it was more like, well, let's just go forward. Um, and I think that war effort, um, the propaganda, well, yeah. the crisis uh, that said, we're going to have to put these other things aside. Um, we're not going to buy new shoes. We're going to buy margarine. We're going to put that little pellet of yellow food coloring in it. We're going to do a lot of things. We're going to save cans. Um, we're going to have a total kind of immersion uh, to make this war effort happen um, and be completed the way it, it needs to be done. When I taught here at UVU, I took students down to interview people from Delta who remembered their wartime experiences. And my students asked, you know, what do you remember? What did you think of the camps? And they admitted, you know, I think differently now. I know better. But at the time, I was maybe a little jealous. It seemed like they had more. It seemed right. like they were more cultured. Um, I came from a very rural, and Delta was very rural, um, isolated community, particularly during World War II, mm -hmm. and have a large population of highly educated, um, very uh, urban um, people move in that all of a sudden outnumbered you severely and had to have facilities like, um, I know some people talk about the hospital at Topaz having more facilities and yeah, better facilities. Uh, the uh -huh. Delta Hospital could uh, take care of 11 patients, 13 if they use the um, uh, the operating room. So. And the illusion that if you did nothing you still got fed and, and as a Delta resident living on a farm where you know maybe you might skip a meal. Um, some kids especially because you know now that we're interviewing people, we're interviewing people who were young during World War II, the people are still alive. They talk about the sense of jealousy and, and my students kept, came back from that experience um, recalling one story in particular um, that when the people of Topaz were allowed temporary passes to go into Delta um, these kids um, perceived that they were buying all of the snacks and the treats and this one woman said you know I didn't know anything all I knew is that um, uh, there weren't any Twinkies on the shelf anymore um, when the attorneys had come into town and so she said the local shopkeeper learned to pull back half of the Twinkie supply and then put it back out after um, the people from Topaz had had their temporary pass so that the local kids could come and buy their treats um, so that kind of basic level of misunderstanding was, was very common, you know. People didn't necessarily understand the bigger picture of what was going on except their day-to-day -day experiences of what was happening. Yeah. And uh, I think there's, um, I feel a real sense of admiration for some of the families that did invite Japanese Americans into their household. Um, you know, one little girl was maybe about in the seventh grade and she said, my friend said, aren't you afraid they'll kill you? And she said, no, they're my friends. And then she said, but he did break my little brother's trike because he was pushing him and stepped on the axle and, and broke the trike. So, um, so 
a, a more human kind of interaction seemed to be a very forgiving kind of interaction instead of that um, continued isolation. Um, your, your father invited someone into your home, or your grandfather no, uh, did? No, um, my father invited someone to um, work in his newspaper office, and uh -huh. instead of living in the house with my family, uh, he lived um, at the newspaper office. Mm -hmm. And there was no shower facility, no bath facility in the newspaper office, but um, my mother invited, uh, his name was Harry Yasuda, into our house to cook Japanese dinner uh, for her friends. They had a, a party and, and invited people to come over. So um, Harry Yasuda's name was a household name um, for us. Um, I never met him, but my mother continued to talk about him uh, long after they were gone. Well, Steve, um, Shirsten uh, uh, asked students if they've heard of this before of the internment camp, and you mentioned that you hadn't heard much of it before. Why do you think it's something that we don't talk about, and why is it important to educate people on this past chapter of, of World War II history? Well, it's changing, and I think internment now, uh, in the present day, is much more in the spotlight than it's ever been. And a lot of that relates to Shurston's uh, not knowing where that legality lies between our government and its people. Uh, so we're seeing a repetition of the, those very same abuses of presidential power, legislative power, governmental power. Uh, but uh, I didn't learn about very much about internment because we were never taught it in school. You know, our, 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 each of our nations, whether it's the United States or any other nation, we all have blemishes on our records. And those which we'd rather not talk about, and internment happened to be one of those up until, you know, just recently. And so now it's being taught much more widely than it ever has been. And it's very useful today, I think very useful today. And I, I kind of refer to it as the Swiss Army knife as, <laughs> of social studies. Because you can talk about immigration issues, you can talk about race issues, you can talk about presidential powers, military powers, civil rights, constitutionality. You cover the whole gamut, the whole spectrum. And so that's why, you know, I think it's very, very useful in today's education. And Shirsten, you were talking about this, you know, teaching the students about doing public history and the, uh, getting the stories of the folks who have, uh, who remembered mm -hmm. having the internment camp there. Um, do your students find these very same dimensions interesting, that there are parallels of topaz with events today? Absolutely. Um, I have students, I've had students um, at Utah Valley and um, and then I continue to have students at um, Cal State San Bernardino who, um, who just really experienced an incredible awakening when they talk to people, um, especially who are in the camps. I have one student in particular who, um, we had a guest speaker come in and talk about being in Topaz and she was just on fire for months afterwards. She wanted to know more. She ended up signing up for a follow-up class that was designated just to talk about Japanese American history and, um, and just couldn't get enough of it. Um, she's an African American student, was very keen on civil rights issues, and found this so interesting to be able to uh, discover another dimension to civil rights and citizenship and law in the United States that she just uh, couldn't get enough of it. And it's really exciting and I see that repeated time and time again, particularly with the personal interaction and um, the fact that we still have many, many people around who are willing and, and able to talk about their firsthand experiences. That means more than reading about it in books. It, it, it certainly does, doesn't it? Jane, how about your students? Have they stayed uh, interested in this, these projects um, over the years? You've brought numerous students into it. Have they kept this interest? I'm not always able to um, maintain um, oh, the level of, of engagement that I would like. Um, now it just depends on what kind of class I have. You know, sometimes students, uh, high school students, can be a little um, kind of picky. I, 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 I know that once uh, 
I was trying to talk to students about Topaz, and they said, didn't you do that last year? <laughs> it's sort of like, isn't it over? Yeah. Uh, so it just depends on when you can connect with, uh, with students. So um, I always give it a try, but um, we're not always as, as successful as, as I would like to be. Let's talk just a little bit about um, preserving Topaz and, and why it's important to preserve it. Steve, why have you become involved in this? Um, my, my interest is the education part. Uh, mm -hmm. And to the extent that the site and the museum serve that purpose of education, then I think it's very, very useful. Uh, Jane's more of a preservationist, and I'm not so much of a preservationist. I, I, my interest is more the education part of that. But uh, it is important because it tells a story, and it tells us our story. You know, not just the Japanese story, but it's all of our stories. Yeah you know, about the nation and where we've come from and where we're going to. So that's, that's my interest in. Well, Jane, after years had passed from the use of this, this uh, camp, you went in and saw it for the first time in your life. What did it look like when you saw it for the first time and what kind of sparked the interest in you that this was something that this, uh, this city needed? to have um, some Well, historical. I probably saw it when I was so young I didn't even know what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. um, I was probably seven or eight or something like that. And um, I, I don't really have a primary memory of that. But I do have the memory of being in town and having uh, just a random someone saying, oh, Topaz, that's where that man was shot. And then someone would say, oh, yes, he was deaf. And right away someone would say, oh, no, he was walking his dog. And someone else would say, no, that's not true. He was trying to escape. And, and uh, in the course of just a few minutes, I could hear maybe 10 different stories. And I didn't recognize it necessarily as folklore. But in my mind, I was thinking, what really happened? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that started my um, sort of thrust into uh, Topaz in the first place, just trying to find out a sense of truth. But you know, it is so complicated, and um, there's, there's so much diversity that can happen. Um, I don't think I'll ever be able to answer that question exactly, but I still have, have more stories about it. Um, and um, so I, I have felt that um, students should be able to, sometimes it's easy for students, especially high school students, to say, right, wrong, right, wrong. But this, they have to play out all of these forces that, um, that show them that life is a little bit more complicated and um, you have to be a little bit more discerning. So um, I've enjoyed when things get to that point with students. Okay, well, Shirsten, what did the camp look like in its heyday? Um, it, it, um, Jane mentioned that it had a large hospital. Um, I think that um, we'd also discussed that maybe there were eight guard towers. H how many barracks and what was the mess hall like? What, 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 from your research, what, what was this place like? You know what, I'll have to defer to Jane on that. But okay. what I will tell you is um, comparing the different camps, um, Topaz was very stark. Um, I went to Manzanar, which is a similar kind of camp in California, for the first time not very long ago. Um, mm -hmm. and. I went there and I saw the trees and the gorgeous mountains and the grass that was growing and the gardens that um, the internees were able to build. And I thought, wow, this is, this is gorgeous. No disrespect the, the for country, the tragedy. It's the country club of internees. It is beautiful. Um, my family has, you know, my husband and my kids have decided that's our favorite place to vacation now is in that valley. It's just gorgeous. Um, I also talked to um, somebody who was in Topaz and someone who was in Colorado and we had a group of them together talking about the conditions and, and the guys from Colorado said something about eating eggs for breakfast and, and the gentleman from Topaz said, what? You had eggs? Why did you resist the draft? You had nothing to complain about. So I think the conditions, um, well, I know the conditions were very different from camp to camp. You know, camps in Arkansas were swampy and had mosquitoes and they had different issues. Topaz is unique in that it was so incredibly desolate and the dust was so bad and the cold could get so bitter. 
um, you really had the harshest of conditions. Mm -hmm. As far as the numbers of the camp, I will defer to Jane. Um, well, what did it look like, Jane? Well, the camp was 19,000 acres. Uh -huh. First of all, that's, that's considerable. Um, I think that's about eight miles um, long and about four miles across. Uh -huh. And then where uh, people lived, that was a mile square. And um, actually the, the housing uh, what took about maybe seven-eighths or maybe three-quarters of that square mile. So 8,000 people living in less than a square mile uh, would cause lots of friction. I heard someone say once, only Japanese Americans because they, have, well, Japanese because they have this kind of group uh, attitude, mm -hmm. you know, the group comes first, um, could pull that off. Um, mm -hmm. Every other um, ethnicity would be killing kill each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but um, so in the square mile, there were 42 blocks, and of the 42 blocks, 36 were, ha had barracks in them. Mm -hmm. And um, each block had 12 barracks and one recreation hall. Mm -hmm. And the barracks were 20 feet wide and 120 feet long, divided into six compartments. So the two ends were about 20 by 15, then 20 by 25, then 20 by 20. So if there were three people in a family, they would be living in a space that was 20 by 15. Um, walk it off. Um, you know, that's... Um, the the that, size that's, of Lower City. Yes, um, there's no 1,700 square feet. There's no 3,000 square foot um, mega kind of house. Incredibly um, uh, tight. Not only are, are they cold or very hot, but they're also flimsy, so you can hear the next door neighbor crying or the babies or um, whatever. So um, the recreation halls provided some respite. Um, each recreation hall was used for a different thing. There were two libraries, one in English, one in, in Japanese. Uh, there were um, co-ops and a canteen and um, um, kindergartens and preschools and a place where there were movies. Um, so two schools, elementary schools, one high school. Um, and then the administrators lived in block one and block two. And about halfway through, they moved people out of um, block one into another um, residential area that they'd built and brought in 250 Hawaiians. Oh. So then that changes because the Hawaiian Japanese and the mainland, they didn't even understand each other half the time because <laughs> the one was speaking pidgin English and the other was speaking, um, um, well, depending on uh, their background. But so um, that was kind of a profile of the camp. And uh, Steve, Jane mentioned that there was a shooting, that uh, uh, the guards told a fellow to stop and he didn't stop. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that uh, and why that was big news? Yeah, and Jane probably knows the story better than I do, but uh, I think it was April 11th, 1943. Right. Uh, James Wakasa, I think he was around 62 years old, and he nobody knows exactly to this day why he was near the fence, but he was at, near the western fence of the camp. And the guard says he yelled down to him, and this is where the story comes, you know, did he hear him, did he not hear him, what was he doing? Some people said he had on layers of clothing like he was escaping somewhere, but if you've ever been out to Topaz, you know, even if you get through the fence, ye, there is nowhere to go. So nobody knows exactly wh what, truly what happened, but uh, the guard did sh actually shoot him. Mm -hmm. Shot him directly through the sternum. Uh -huh. um, so the likelihood that he was going between the barbed wire, which by the way, the barbed wire was only just about four strands high. Uh -huh. So it wasn't that 10 foot high with the razor wire on the top. So mm -hmm. stepping through it would have been really no problem. Um, it, it wasn't an impossibility. Mm -hmm. um, but then after that, there's uh, again a controversy. Um, one side says that when the director came back and found that uh, someone had been shot under his watch. He was so angry that he told the soldiers they could keep their guns, but he got all the bullets. Oh. And so then uh, there was a short, uh, kind of a works uh, stoppage, kind of a strike kind of 
a funeral with 5,000 people attending. And uh, so there was a, a difference in the guard kind of maneuvering whether they had bullets or not. I'm not really certain at this point. But then people had more freedom to go out. Um, they could even go to the motor pool and check out a truck and go out into the, the desert and have a picnic or get stuck or find a meteorite or, you know, just the common ordinary things that you do when you're out in the desert. Well, sadly, our time is up. And I think that we could go on for another hour talking about this very important time in history and a time that helps define our democracy uh, for us today. So Steve Koga, thank you. Jane Beckwith, appreciate your being here. And Shirsten Lyon, thank, thank you, you for coming and joining us. Thank you.